to another episode of Handloader TV, and we're continuing on with our series on World War II small arms. And to help me out with this, we have Mike Venerino, mm -hmm. author of Shooting World War II Small Arms. And what have we got here today, Mike? This is an American, Springfield 1903A4. That meant it had a scope, the A4 part did. That's what that designation yeah. meant? Yeah, okay. uh, actually the A means alteration and it, they went through one, two, three. This was the alteration four. Oh, okay. Yeah. And they're an interesting gun. Uh, they're not going to win any prizes as a sniper rifle. The Springfield action, of course, is beautiful action. Mm -hmm. But they put these two and a half power Weaver scopes on. They were in such a hurry, they just took these off dealer shelves all over the country. These weren't ordered special for the military. Really? Yeah, for the most part. And then. These rifles, you can always tell when one of these rifles is is legit as a sniper rifle. The A an A4. See the address here is upside down, the marking. Yeah. On a regular A3, it's under what the scope mount would cover up. So they moved the marking to the left to side. To the left side of the receiver. So you can al always tell what an original rifle A4 now is. That's, that's really good yeah. to know. As someone who's interested in those rifles. I've always liked the A4 and I thought, man, it'd be really neat to find one, but you, there's a lot of people who have kind of hodgepodged them together, That's parts, right. kits. Yeah. That's really good. And another thing they had was that regular A3s had straight grip scope, uh, excuse me, stocks. This one had a nice pistol grip on it, better for pulling it in for accurate shooting. Mm -hmm. uh, all of these A4s were made by Remington. Uh, oh, okay. Model 1903 A3s were made by Smith Corona and Remington, but only Remington made the A4s. And they didn't even start till the 1st of 1943. The war had been going on for quite a while. Then. Wow. The United States had no sniper program when the war started. Hmm. And at that time, the Russians said they had 60,000 trained snipers, and I don't doubt it. And the Germans followed them and really got into sniper rifles. The Japanese went to war with sniper rifles. America waited till we were deep into the war before they even started. Wow, that's very interesting. And I did not know that. Then they didn't actually train the snipers. They picked the man out of the unit that was the best shot and gave him a sniper rifle. So, okay, you're a sniper now. <laughs> wow. Uh, but uh, they didn't pick these guns for accuracy, they just took them right off the shelf. Really? The Germans and the uh, Soviets, I don't know about the Japanese, but the Germans and the Soviets and the British all tested their rifles for accuracy, and only the best ones were made into sniper rifles. So you had a leg up over your standard infantry rifle, but yeah. not so with the That's U.S. Right. Wow. So. It's a little disappointing. <laughs> it, it was disappointing to the men that got them, too. And as I was pointing out to you, there's no alternate for, for the scope. If this rifle was damaged in combat, the man using it was unarmed then. Yeah. He had no way of fighting. All the other nation's rifles, the scope could either be taken off easily or you could actually see the sights under the scope, hmm. as, as we'll see when we go on further. Yeah. But these were still good rifles. They would shoot modestly good, uh, not perfectly. But p someone asked me once, how do I pick out a good Springfield? I said, look down the barrel. If it's good and smooth, it's going to shoot decently. I've never seen a bad Springfield. Hmm. So. There you go. Yeah. So quick question about the rifling. There was various different types of rifling mm -hmm. for these too. Do you, did the A4 have a specific rifling or two well, groove, four groove? Since they were pushing, pulling them off the line, uh, I've never seen one with two groove, but this is four groove. Four groove, yeah. okay. And some of the early, I think they were Smith Coronas, actually had barrels made by uh, uh, the pistol manufacturer, high standard. Oh, okay. Uh, and had six grooves. Really? Yeah. But I've never seen one for sure. I just read that. Hmm. Very but, interesting. But you can tell that they had to alter the bolt 
to clear the scope. See how they machine this oh. flat? Mm-hmm. So it would clear. That's a good way to tell if it's got a matching bolt then too, I assume. Yeah. Mm -hmm. If it's cut like that, it was meant to be a sniper rifle. Okay. Mm -hmm. So any special care or considerations of scopes? Are they pretty fragile? you got to be careful with those? Scopes are very fragile. Okay. Yes. Like I said, these were made for civilian hunters. They weren't made for combat. Mm -hmm. Later, I think after the war, they started getting some military issue scopes into them. Uh, a point that this rifle, all Springfields have this let, latch here. Right. And you can have it that way, the bolt comes out, or you can have it up, and then, well, the bolt still comes out <laughs> if you don't do it right. There. The barrel comes up and uh, shows you that the gun is empty. You couldn't load this one with stripper clips, so what a lot of snipers did, they loaded the magazine with five rounds individually, and then they put the, this lever all the way down, ah. and then they could fire a single shot, just throw a round in the action, close the bolt and fire a single shot, pull it out, do it again, and then if something happened in an emergency, they could flip this up and they would have the entire magazine at their hands then. That's kind of neat. Mm -hmm. Very cool. So when it comes to hand loading for it and the ammunition, do you have a pet load for this particular rifle? Or I have two. Okay. Um, I used Hodgson H4350 before I had an M1 Garand. You're not supposed to use slow powders or extra heavy bullets in Garands. Mm -hmm. They'll bend the operating rods. So I worked that load up. Any 150 to 155 grain bullet will help you duplicate military ballistics. Mm -hmm. And you've got to run it at 2,700, which is really easy to do with right. 30 out 6. Uh, but if you're going to load ammunition that's going to be in both the Springfield and the Garand, go to Varga powder, load 46 grains of Varga powder, ah. duplicates the military ballistics, and it won't hurt a Garand. Well, that's really neat and good to know. Yeah. It's nice to have that versatility. Yes. Well, with that said, what do you say we take this guy out and we hit the range and... Yep. Put a little time behind it. We'll do a couple shots, make sure the scope's on, and then we'll see what we can do for accuracy. Sounds good to me. Okay. So we got the 1903A4 out on the range. The target's at 100 yards, and I got Mike back here spotting for me. So we're going to see if we can hit it with this old rifle. And away we go. Right in the sternum. They did a pretty good job sighting it in, Mike. That was six inches above the last dead line with it. Okay. Right between the first two. Well, if nothing else, I'm consistent. I'd say that pretty well proves our point. It's an accurate rifle. So we've gone ahead and reset, and we have a target downrange at 200 yards now. And we figured we'd prove a point with just how accurate these rifles can be. So again, Mike's spotting for me. Ready, Mike? Spotter's on. All right, here we go. Okay, four inches in from the left, dead center for elevation. Dead center for elevation, four yep. inches in from the left. Yep. Good shot. All right, let's see if we can do that again.
okay, about four inches above that. A little, little bit of high of center and about five inches in from the left. Okay, maybe a little bit of me factor and a little bit of wind factor on that one. Yeah, good shoot. Pretty happy with that. For a rifle I haven't had much time behind, I mean about what, maybe five, six rounds? That's right. <laughs> Pretty good. So we've got some watermelons downrange at 200 yards. Actually, probably just a touch further than 200 yards. And I've got Mike Venturino back there spotting for me. And I'm going to see if I can hit one of those with the 1903 A4 sniper rifle. So you all set up on the left melon, Mike? I'm on. All right. Let's see if I can do this. You got it. <laughs> it jumped. It jumped? Yeah. Bullets weren't expanding. Yeah, I think these are just full metal jackets, so. Well, I think they're hollow points, but they're boat tail hollow points. Oh, yep, you're, you're correct. The guy knows his hand loads. Hey, that's pretty good, though, on the first shot. Mm-hmm. <laughs> So we're back from the range now after shooting a ton of different military World War II sniper rifles. And we've just got our favorites here on the table because we can't fit all of the rifles that we shot. And we thought we'd go ahead and wait until we shot each one of the rifles and then we'd talk about all of them kind of individually. Mm -hmm. And we picked out a few favorites of ours. Mm -hmm. So where do you want to start, Mike? Well, I got to apologize about the Japanese rifle. In their introduction, I was pretty mean to it. But when we sighted it in, and I was working with that, and I started using the tick marks in the scope and remembering where they were, I started hitting well with that. I'm, I'm proud of it. I would be too. And here's a really interesting thing that really surprised me. I was trying to shoot this rifle. I could not hit anything with it. And then Mike would go, oh, let me see. And he'd get behind it, and he'd shoot and hit, hit, hit. <laughs> He was the one who hit all those watermelons at 200 plus yards, and you blew them to pieces. Well, it took me a couple shots to get on them, but once I got the tick mark that I needed, then hit, then hit, and boy, it blew them up, didn't it? It did. It did yeah. a great job. Now, I was proud of that. I guess you know which one of these rifles I'm going to be reloading for next. I'm going to have to take a guess <laughs> and say it's this Japanese yeah, rifle. That's right. Now, my personal favorite, it's kind of tough, because I did like the British rifle a whole lot. Mm -hmm. But I, I, I have to admit, that 1903A4, I hit that watermelon, the bullet punch cleaned through it, and it barely moved, didn't blow up, or wasn't anything exciting to watch. Mm -hmm. But I hit that the first shot, and that really impressed me. Then with the British rifle, <laughs> I was kind of... Well, I was cutting it up into bite-sized chunks, I guess you could say. Well, he was slicing the end off the watermelon. I, I thought, just hit it in the center, make it easy. <laughs> uh, uh, one thing I got to say is the American, American, the British, they have scopes on them that you have a dial for windage, you have a dial for elevation or elevation windage, and you can zero them in right now. The Japanese scope's got no adjustment whatsoever. You better learn how to use those tick marks if you expect to ever hit anything. Uh, the German rifle has elevation, but the, the uh, windage is in the, the mount, so you've got to worry about two different things, and you've got to have tools to fix the elevation. Uh, the Soviet guns, pretty good. They also have scopes that you can use the different uh, mounts on, or excuse me, the different dials. <sighs> but their trigger pulls are so bad. I will painfully attest to that. I mean, the, that Mosin rifle you have with the scope on it, my goodness, I could have got a cup of coffee and come back and that trigger still wouldn't have broke. I mean, it was, <laughs> it was atrocious. Yeah. But that said, it was an accurate rifle. If I you can master the trigger on it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, if you just take your time, hold center, and keep those crosshairs there all while you're squeezing... Mm -hmm. It can be a pretty accurate and mm -hmm. deadly rifle for sure. 
And then the um, the Soviet SVT-40 was pretty impressive, too. Mm -hmm. And you were saying they issued that to a lot of women. And, and after mm -hmm. shooting it, the trigger, I think, was actually better than the Mosin. By mm -hmm. a not much better, but it was better. Mm -hmm. Not saying much, but a little bit. A little bit. Mm -hmm. So I wouldn't have a problem taking that rifle over the Mosin any day, honestly. Mm -hmm. And I've got 10 rounds, and it's semi-automatic. It's a good rifle. It is. It's a mm -hmm. really good rifle. And then we had the German semi-automatic, which was a K-43. K-43, and it's a loser. <laughs> uh, I don't know what it was with that scope, but it was hard to get it to hit anything. And the Germans did make it up as a sniper rifle and then had to admit that it was a poor excuse for a sniper rifle. Really? Mm -hmm. Now, that's pretty interesting. If they themselves admitted, mm -hmm. it's pretty poor. Yeah, we had a real hard time with that one. It took a lot of rounds to, to get on target and get that thing zeroed and, and working yeah. right. That's right. But uh, we eventually got some hits with it, and it, mm. it worked. It required too much time and effort. Yeah, I, I'd agree with you there, for mm -hmm. sure. Let's see, that covers the British, the American. Did we leave anything out? Two Soviet, we used those, uh, K-43. Oh, the Mauser, yeah. The, the Mauser is a really accurate rifle. Uh, but again, as I mentioned, you have to uh, change the windage in the mount. The scopes are only elevation adjustable. And that's a, a problem sometimes. You have to have tools to change your windage. Yeah, yeah. And now you were using a really neat tool, that Wyoming Sight Drifter, to drift the base uh, over. That's right. I forgot about that. That's so easy to use. You just pull the end, spring load it, go whack, and it'll move the sight for you. And that's the first time I've ever seen one of those used. And so if you have one of those old Mausers with those bases like that, that's a must-have. Check that tool out. It was really neat to watch Mike get that rifle zeroed. And then uh, I got to shoot a watermelon with it. <laughs> and it was a little bit high, but I think th I think I hit it in three shots with your good spotting. Thank you. <laughs> so that was a lot of fun. Again, we'll have videos on all of these rifles. Be sure to check those out. But we barely scratched the surface here. If you want to learn more about these rifles, the loads Mike has worked up, which we've been shooting this whole time. Feel bad. We probably went through a lot of your hand loads. It was fun. It was fun. It was a lot of fun. But if you want to learn more, be sure to check out his book, Shooting World War II Small Arms. It is filled with information on all these rifles and so much more. And be sure to look for the other videos continuing on in this series. With that said, I want to give a special thanks to Mike for opening up his collection, his private range, and the shooting shack so we could do mm -hmm. this. So thank you so much, Mike. I appreciate it. I'm glad you're here. It's good to be here. I'd also offer a special thanks to Ted Tompkins. He was our official gopher. I like that title. That was a good title. Mm -hmm. He ran around, spray painted the targets for us, got us lunch. He was just a great help, wrangling the rifles, going back and forth to the range. So special thanks to Ted Tompkins. Also a special thanks to Chris Downs, who does all the photography and film work here. He does a great job getting you those good angles so you can watch those watermelons explode. And then special thanks to Don Polachek, owner of Wolf Publishing Company, making this all possible. So don't forget to give this video a thumbs up if you liked what you saw. Don't forget to subscribe and hit the bell icon so you're notified when the next video comes out. And then as always, if you have any questions or comments, be sure to leave them in the comments section below. I hope you had a great time watching this video and that it came across just as exactly as it was. Two guys learning new things about various things, shooting, the scopes. I mean, I think mm -hmm. you learned something new with this Arasaka. Or type. I did. It's been sitting here for years because I was mad at it. I'm and not mad at it anymore. No, it's your favorite. <laughs> sort of. So, I yeah. mean, it was just so much fun to learn these things and to get to shoot these old rifles. So, We'll catch you guys in the next episode. <laughs>